Delegates and representatives from 54 countries united for the world's largest land restoration and programming conference, the Accelerating Nature-Based Solutions Conference. Hosted by the Global Evergreening Alliance, the Government of Zambia, AFRI 100 and Uda Nepad, the five-day event was a groundbreaking initiative bringing together NGOs, government officials, private sector, technical and scientific experts, and community representatives. Held in Zambia's tourist city Livingston from March 11 to March 15, 2024, the global gathering marked a significant milestone in the collective effort to addressing pressing environmental challenges through collaborative action. The conference's main aim was to foster meaningful discussions, share innovative solutions, and build partnerships that would accelerate the global commitment to land restoration and sustainable development. The challenges that we've all been grappling with over recent decades, increasing land degradation, population growth, increasingly frequent and severe weather events, and an impending global climate catastrophe, to name just a few. Just two weeks ago, the president of Zambia declared a national emergency due to the current drought and its catastrophic impact on agriculture and food security. But the past few years has also seen the emergence of some incredible opportunities for addressing these global challenges through scaling up nature-based solutions, particularly through large-scale collaborative efforts and with private sector investment. An example of these opportunities is the approach of the Restore Africa program, Africa's largest ever farmer-led land restoration program, and possibly the largest farmer-led carbon removals program on the planet. This conference is intended to be a working event in every sense, an event which draws on your insights, which tackles the barriers that have prevented nature-based solutions from being scaled up. Allow me to sincerely thank the organizers of the conference for choosing to host the Accelerating Nature-Based Solution Conference here in Livingston. And ladies and gentlemen, I must make mention that His Excellency the President of the Republic of Zambia, Mr. Agarin Chilema, would have definitely loved to be here. This is the kind of discussions that you'd like to hear, considering that the only thing that we have as a people is our natural resource, and we need to safeguard it really, really jealously. I'm informed that this important gathering has brought together global thought leaders, change makers, and action takers to address the challenges of climate change and formulate plans for scaling up nature-based solutions. Zambia, ladies and gentlemen, like any other country, has not been spared from the effects of climate change, which have negatively impacted our endowed, beautiful biodiversity. The first day of the conference witnessed an inspiring array of speeches from distinguished guests panel discussions and thematic sessions, all emphasizing the pivotal role of communities and grassroots initiatives in addressing global challenges related to biodiversity. We can deal with papers, we can deal with policies, but if that does not benefit the most vulnerable in the villages, then we are not achieving what we are here for. Let this conference be one such that people say, yes, they met in Zambia, the next one. They talked, they agreed, they implemented. Now we are living a life and not surviving. <laughs> it's only when people start to live a life that they can contribute meaningfully to the development of their countries. Today, we stand at a critical juncture facing the truth that is both a challenge and an opportunity. Africa, a continent of unparalleled beauty and diversity, is confronting, like the rest of the world, severe environmental degradation. This degradation threatens not only the rich tapestries of ecosystems and have tried, that have tried for millennia, but also the very communities that depend on them for their livelihood, their culture, and their future. Honorable Rodney Sikumba, Zambia's Minister of Tourism, expressed delight to have so many partners in conservation with one common goal of saving the planet. Chris Amitage, CEO of the Global Evergreening Alliance, emphasized the need for practical and collaborative nature in an effort to tackle barriers to nature-based solutions. I'll speak to 
what we've essentially done within the Ministry of Tourism. Number one, if you're talking about uh, aspects to do with investment in the sector. So most of the people would like to invest in protected areas, but when you come in there, we make sure that whatever infrastructure that you build is eco-friendly. And that's the reason why we're talking about eco-tourism today. It's a buzzword, but I think I love it. It's something that will now naturally blend into the ecosystem itself. More so that we have actually gone further to actually handhold most of our collaborative management partners. We also um, increasingly are finding investors wanting to invest in programs that provide good opportunities for marketing collateral, for, for improving their brand. And this means um, being able to tell uh, stories about the direct impacts, the, the direct benefits being received from landholders, from the, the participants of these programs, and from equitable benefit sharing, not just from the activities that are being supported by the programs, but by any other revenues being generated, such as carbon credits. Some of the delegates who attended the conference highlighted the significance of the gathering and spoke about some of the best approaches to achieving nature-based solutions. The conference is very important for our organization, but also for the country at large, largely because of the issues that we are experiencing around climate change and also the recently declared national emergency and disaster. So this conference comes at opportune time as it enables us to discuss solutions that we could use in terms of uh, how we could uh, overcome some challenges which are being exacerbated by climate change, largely due to human uh, activities. And that's why this conference is very important to us as an institution, looking at the work that we do in the conservation sector. As you may see, this is an international conference. It is a global conference which has brought about stakeholders from various countries around the world. And uh, we are talking about nature-based solutions. But uh, these solutions are also affecting communities. And uh, as an organization that is working directly with communities, we are looking at um, summarizing all the solutions that are being proposed here, summarizing the information to take it down to the grassroots. Climate change is affecting children uh, just as much as it's affecting adults, but they're the ones who are least responsible for this climate change. So children are going to be part and parcel of the solution. Um, as Save the Children, we've been working with children in Zambia for 40 years and children are increasingly asking us to help them with how to work against climate change. One of the key identified catalysts of accelerating nature-based solutions was meaningful leadership, capable of making decisions that put the planet first. We heard from a leadership advocate who attended the conference. In the next 20, 30 or 50 years, if we had reclaimed the climate, if we had restored the climate, how would that look like? Now, in order to get to that, we need a different kind of leadership. We need a leadership that is standing in 50 years or 100 years. Uh, we want to ask ourselves, what will we have done to have reclaimed the climate, to have restored the climate? What is it that needs to be done? And of course, we don't want to stay stand in the clouds. We want to come back and really begin to generate solutions that get to where we are going. We do not want to generate the solutions from where we are, because where we are, there are a lot of challenges. You have drought, for example, in Zambia. You can't resolve it today and tomorrow. But certainly we can be able to say, how could we, what could we do if we were to deal with the issue of drought, if we were to eliminate it even, how would that look like? What would we need to do in order to do that? To do that? So it may need massive planting of trees. It may need massive restoration of uh, water catchment areas. So if we don't have leaders who are thinking in that way, then we are really missing out. The agriculture sector was top on the agenda, with a focus on how smallholder farmers in Africa can adapt to climate change. We have been very successful in introducing a system of farming that keeps farmers sedentary. So they can stay on their land year after year after year. And that's the way we're restoring, letting nature plant the seeds. Nature does it better than anybody. And now we see farmers living together with nature in that way. We are a business that helps farmers get more value from their farming through the sale of our, our branded products called It's Wild. Um, and this gives real incentives because we, we pay a, a premium value for the crops. Um, but we do this um, in exchange for their commitment to keep adopting these farming practices. Um, and if they do this, 
um, and they stay sedentary. We also help them to monitor uh, the amount of carbon that's being stored on the land. How are we going to transition these conversations? Because if we are talking about communities and sustainable you know, systems that are going to work for restoration, who is going to handle these farms? Do they know how best these farms will be handled? How is FMNR going to be adaptable, understood by the young generation? So my concern and what I am now very passionate about is to bridge the intergenerational gap. We want young people to understand the traditional way farmers used to take care of the environment because FMNR is basically a traditional agroforestry practice and farmers understood the benefit of trees and they protected these trees for certain reasons. So as a, um, speaking from the perspective of my organization, the Global Evergreening Alliance, we are an action alliance. Um, our, our role is to facilitate the development and implementation of massive scale programs with all stakeholders. So we, um, we're a, a convener. Um, uh, bringing everybody together and we already have a number of investors that are quite well progressed in committing to large-scale investments in Zambia to support hundreds of thousands of small-scale farmers and pastoralists to develop more sustainable livelihoods and to restore degraded agricultural landscapes. On land restoration, organizations and projects such as the AFRI 100 spoke about the programs currently being implemented in Africa. Various stakeholders also gave insight on community-led nature-based solutions investments. One of the things that we want to do as an alliance is to support AFR 100 in meeting at least 10% of the targets that each country has set. So right now we're investing in Kenya, Uganda and Malawi and active programming and design is going on for Tanzania, Ethiopia and Zambia. We've got investors that are in this conference that we are discussing with about Ethiopia, Tanzania and Zambia. Uh, the project mainly uh, aims at restore, uh, restoring 150,000 hectares of land, of which 50%, which is 75,000 hectares, uh, will be directly restored by World Vision, uh, where our cells will go in with our structures to, uh, to restore 75,000, while the other 75,000 is aimed at um, working with uh, like-minded partners that will bring on board to do the restoration of the other part. Meanwhile, on the sidelines of the conference, Zambia's Lands Minister, Elijah Muchima, led a team of other ministers alongside the Global Evergreening Alliance, CEO, on a tree planting exercise at Nali Tue Primary and Secondary School in Livingston. This was one way of walking the talk beyond the conference. Everything else is anchored on land. Everything else is anchored on natural resource. You are a natural resource in your own way. We are talking about biodiversity and ecosystem. When you plant a tree, the tree brings a lot of benefits. We want to inculcate this spirit into especially you young ones. Talking about agroforestry, and this is what we're talking about. We need to see how best we could incentivize the smallholder farmers. These are the ones who are lifeblood to us. We plant trees for life. We cannot live without trees. We need trees more than they need us. So it is very critical that Planting of trees should not be taken as an event, but a way of life. It should be inculcated in our culture, it should be part of our culture. Um, this conference brings together representatives from more than 54 countries to focus on accelerating nature-based solutions, particularly working with small-scale small vulnerable farming communities around the world to 
um, establish agroforestry practices and restore degraded land to increase the productivity, the reliability and the resilience of farming systems and food production. The thematic streams of the event were strategically designed to address key areas such as scaling nature-based solutions, policy, advocacy and carbon markets, and sustainable finance. Also, examples of really successful projects. Right? You all think you've got successful projects. You may have some pretty pictures, I bet you don't have good data. So really thinking it from an investor's point of view, what data do they need to convince them about the next one? Collect it right from the beginning, don't think of it later. And I think we're now getting to a point where we are seeing, literally, like now we're in a drought situation, we're actually seeing some of the repercussions and the risks coming out of what happens when we do not take care of the environment. And I think that's opening doors now for, for, for conversations around this you know, the true value that nature is providing to companies and how that needs to be factored into the economic models. You've seen the impact of the El Nino on the farming on, on the farms across the country. So already ZICB is in high form gear. We are coming up with strategies, uh, products that we can use to help our smallholder farmers recover from the disaster that has happened across the country. So coming here to learn and to understand what innovations exist and what are available, it's an opportunity for us to be able to come up with a solution that supports our government of the day uh, in bringing growth and sustainability, building resilience in the communities that have been affected. We are helping um, entrepreneurs to be able to use technology to accelerate their growth, to have exponential growth in their businesses. So all of this is coming together, including farming itself. If we apply technology in farming, instead of producing 2.5 tons per hectare, we can actually move on to producing 10 tons per hectare. But we have to ensure we are doing this using sustainable methods, but also we should not shy away from applying technology. Some of the key highlights of the conference included the AFRI 100 Land Accelerator Program, which set out to fund 100 youth and women-led green initiatives. Head of the project, Mamadou Jakite, said each project would receive $5,000. Go to the website where we have around 500 projects. And as I think all the value chain and commodity that Peter mentioned are there. And we have some so strong safeguards. You know, maybe all of you know what is the land accelerator. You can uh, Google it, whereby every year we do call for proposals for a land entrepreneur woman to apply. Can we force an out of 300 applicants, we select 100 because of this is the funding available. Once they go to the entrepreneurship, land management, business um, uh, training, we, we hand them 5,000 to do a startup. Can we force five, 100 women uh, you selected in a very open to do all the same uh, culture. This is not possible. It is not uh, visible. And to 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 show the level of loyalty and um, adherence and uh, support of AFA 100. Any conversations around scaling nature-based solutions um, should take into consideration the contribution that women have had in um, accelerating uh, nature-based solutions. And um, it's also important to recognize that they are a major constituency in most of the interventions, whether in agriculture or in climate mitigation strategies. Women have played a major role and have also contributed to major social and economic benefits in their
communities. Zambia's Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Elijah Muchima, closed the five-day conference with a call for increased collaboration and integration of rural communities in Africa, as they were the most affected by climate change. I'm honored to address you on behalf of the government of the Republic of Zambia. This was an important conference as it was being held during the severe drought that has hit most parts of Zambia. The government of Zambia will look to see which nature-based solutions from the conference will assist in addressing the impact of climate change. Land is a critical factor. Everything we are talking about is based on land. Human being looks to land. Tree looks to land. The rain wanted to wake the land in order for us to produce food. But now, as we restore land, we want also to increase production in terms of food, agriculture. The nature of this, um, this event, the fact that it's so focused on what so many of us um, are so passionate about, um, it's, it's very, very targeted. It brings all of the practitioners working on nature-based solutions together in a forum focused on action, focused on improving the way we work in a, in a really tangible way. We're not here to just listen to, to what others are working on. We're here to network and build opportunities to expose um, new ways of working. And so many of you have told me that in the sidelines of the conference, you have not just made meaningful connections, but actually progressed meaningful opportunities. That there are new partnerships that have been developed during the last few days. That there are new programs now being designed in the sidelines of the conference that wouldn't have happened, or certainly wouldn't have happened in the foreseeable future, if those people hadn't come together in an environment that fostered that collaborative action. The conference was a platform for knowledge exchange, fostering collaboration between diverse stakeholders committed to the restoration of our planet's ecosystems. The conference, which brought together representatives from various sectors and regions, amplified the impact of nature-based solutions in the face of global environmental challenges.